So good morning to everybody. Uh, many of my friends and uh, can identify many people in the batch today. Uh, nice to be meeting on the morning at 8 a.m. Uh, thanks for inviting me uh, to be here on this uh, a special topic, I feel, about the perioperative fasting and feeding practices. When I say special, it's mainly because this is an ISA, Indian Society of Anesthesia, uh, and uh, this was taken up by me about uh, nearly four and a half years ago. So all of us uh, know we depend upon American guidelines, we depend upon British guidelines, and we are comfortable uh, majority of the times, but sometimes we feel that there is uh, no Indian touch. For example, when I talk about fasting and feeding, so we are very much different from Western population uh, in terms of what we consume, uh, because there is a difference in terms of the fat content, the calorie content, and other nutrients. Uh, uh, between the different states and also within the state also, region to region, then even district to district, there is a change in the food habits. And even uh, there is a lot of uh, difference in terms of socio-cultural, geographic and economic factors across the country. So this is one of the reasons I proposed to our ISA national body that let us have our own guidelines. So I was fortunate to get uh, approval and cooperation from our governing council and the general body that uh, uh, I, I would take up about five important guidelines. The first one we took up was about the perioperative fasting and feeding. So when I say feeding, this is a new uh, word also which we wanted to use as a positive connotation. So this input came from Dr. Pankaj Kundra, who was also among uh, one of the well-wishers with respect to the academics in ISA, all of you know. So we always say fasting. Fasting is, gives a negative feeling. So feeding, so when can somebody be fed or till what time somebody can be fed and when somebody can be fed in the post-operative period. So this is one and uh, there was no uniformity across the country. Then we decided let us have a judicious practice of perioperative fasting and feeding. And this is uh, not only addressed to us as anesthesia, that is definitely because we have done it extremely scientifically. It applies to our certain colleagues and uh, medical college and paramedical setups also who are involved in the patient management. This guideline obviously is mainly for patients who undergo anesthesia or deep sedation. And uh, let us go to some uh, basics here. So what is simplest at the simple ground level or the basic level, why the patient has to be fasted? So all of us know if uh, the patient has not been fasted, so there is a risk of uh, regurgitation of the gastric contents into the lungs and it can precipitate aspiration immunities. This is more likely in the perioperative period because there is impairment or abolition of the airway reflexes because of the various drugs or the medical or the surgical conditions. All of us uh, have been taught and some of us still remember uh, that uh, aspirate volumes of more than two, 25 ml in or the pH of less than 2.5 can precipitate significant pulmonary aspiration and which can lead on to, for example, uh, a picture like ARDS. So this critical volume of 25 ml and a critical pH of less than 2.5 was considered significant for at least about three decades. Uh, this was based upon a study by Roberts and Shirley who talked about uh, an experiment performed in, in a single rhesus monkey only. They instilled acid into one bronchus and they studied and they said this is, these are the figures. So we blindly followed this advice for these three, nearly three decades but it cannot be taken as the correct one. So why it is so, I'll also talk about it. And it's, uh, we also remember about Mendelssohn syndrome. So aspiration syndrome is named after uh, Dr. Curtis L. Mendelssohn. Uh, he had this publication in 1946 itself. He talked about uh, uh, the aspiration of stomach contents into the lung during optic anesthesia. Of course, uh, that stage one, two, three, four uh, is very good and well explained, but problem was, uh, majority of his uh, the cases were uh, given inhalation anesthesia, for example, like ether and chloroform, number one, and majority of them had a lot of complications. So complicated cases uh, and inhalation agent, definitely there is a greater risk of regurgitation and possibility of aspiration. So this is about uh, the publication by Shirley, where he talked about these volumes and the pH. So nowadays, I will take you forward. So this is no longer held valid. 
because we have got the bedside ultrasound available nowadays, any volume less than 1.5 ml per kg would be taken as indicative of empty stomach or presence of a solid content in the stomach. So what if we prolong the fasting beyond the recommended time? This is also an important consideration. See, uh, not normally all these guidelines would apply, like if we take up the patient electively, we follow all the recommendations in terms of the timings, and uh, you take the patient as a first in the OT list, or if there is a small list of the operation in the institutions. But uh, some of our institution or majority of our institution, we've got a huge list, and the patients may be fasted, for longer than even 8 hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, that is very commonly seen. Uh, problem is always there. There are a lot of physiological consequences. There could be glycogenolysis caused by low insulin and high glycogen. And surgical stress-induced insulin resistance can occur, catabolism, gluconeogenesis, protein, sodium losses. In fact, patient himself or herself will feel very unhealthy, sick and there will be, uh, thirst itself is very discomforting. And it can, if it is a pediatric patient, it is found that it can lead on to dehydration, hypotension, and even acidosis. And definitely the child will keep on crying. So these are the problems related to fasting beyond the recommended timing. So how are the evidences collected? How was the research conducted before in terms of seeing whether the stomach is empty or it is full? So there is a list of the various techniques that could be used uh, for long. If you look at the first one, the scintigraphy using radio labeled meals was considered as a gold standard for many years. But of course, uh, there are many other things, including physically putting a rail tube and aspirating, trying to see what is the volume. Uh, definitely, they cannot be correct. There will be some pockets of uh, within the stomach where you cannot reach. The rail tube also cannot reach. The last one, the gastric ultrasound, which I have highlighted, is now most practical bedside uh, technique which is available to us and it has been almost validated now to be the best one. So you cannot imagine the patient being taken to a radiology suit for measuring things. You cannot take the patient to MRI on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's the reason gastric ultrasound has attained great popularity nowadays. This is another basic uh, single slide about the physiology. So if you look at this uh, curve here, the horizontal is uh, the x-axis is the time after consumption, the vertical axis is the percentage of stomach contents. If somebody drinks clear liquids like water and he, he takes food, the first curve is about water. So there is no lag, there is an exponential fall. Within one hour, 95% of the water is clear from the stomach. And if it is a food, uh, or a solid somebody has taken. So initially there is a lag phase because whatever is taken, it goes into the stomach. It becomes, pro uh, it is broken down into smaller particles. Everything mixes together. And this itself takes about one to one and a half hours. So this is initial lag period. Then gradually there is a emptying of the stomach. So this normally takes four hours and beyond. Six, eight or 10 or even 12 hours, depending upon the type of food and the volume of food. This is very important to understand just to convey that water is definitely cleared almost to the extent of 95% in one number. But can stomach be really empty? So it cannot be because there is a continued saliva secretions at one ml per kg per hour, there are continued secretions from the stomach. There could be some amount of small intestinal secretions. And in fact, studies have shown that gastric volumes of more than 25 ml with a pH of less than 2.5 were demonstrated in 40 to 80 percent of adequately fasted healthy patients without any medical or surgical problems also. And plus all of us know we have got a lot of perioperative factors so patient could have pain, anxiety, uh, patient could be obese, pregnancy, hypothyroid, diabetes or we could be using some drugs like opioids then there could be surgical factors per se, anesthetic factors. So all of them in effect can result in delay in gastric emptying, reduction in the barrier pressure. Barrier pressure is the pressure difference between the intragastric pressure and the lower esophageal sphincter tone. And definitely there is a risk of suppression of directive airway reflexes. So this is the reason there is a greater risk in the perioperative period. So people did observe the problem with the patients having some stomach, I mean food in the stomach. So there are attempts to create fasting guidelines since 1846. So if you can look at this, List here, 1847, 58, and so many people had 
their own recommendations. So somebody said two hours, four hours, three hours. So there are different recommendations for long. But a systematic evidence collection and guidelines formulation occurred only in 1999, when the American Society of Anesthesiologists published the first guidelines on preoperative fasting. So then we had other guidelines from Scandinavian Society, Royal Society, ASA updates, European Society, and everything. And our guidelines were published in 2020. After our guidelines were published in June 2020, we had the European Society guidelines purely on pediatric 2022. You can always have a look into it. And the ASA, just one month ago, in January 2023, has mm -hmm. a special update on carbohydrate-containing clear liquids with or without protein, chewing gum, and pediatric fasting duration. So this is the update for you in terms of the various guidelines. So coming back to our guidelines, the ISA guidelines. So I told you this was published in 2020, uh, July, basically. And we have covered the adults, obstetric population, bariatric population, pediatric patients, receiving anesthesia or deep sedation while undergoing elective surgery and procedures. So we had the objective to recommend the minimum fasting duration for solids, semi-solids, non-clear liquids and clear liquids, and to recommend the minimum time duration before resumption of oral intake in the post-operative period. This we attempted for the first time. I will give you, we could get some evidences, I can tell you later. And to also prevent delays and cancellations of scheduled procedures. We get some sort of, get into some sort of controversy when people tell anesthetist has cancelled the case and other things. So we thought we should also consider this and have a sound legal background also with respect to many things related to fasting. So we had certain uh, uh, definitions which are applicable with respect to collection of evidences and how long, what is preoperative fasting, what is empty stomach. This is normal when we talk about guideline formulation. But one thing I have to highlight here is about the non-clear liquids and clear liquids. So we know um, clear liquids. So many of us have been taught uh, that clear liquid is something which, is, uh, can, which can be seen through a glass of water. And you will be able to see the printed material on the other side. This was uh, explained to us for a long time, but this uh, definition is no longer valid. So all the recent the guidelines will not talk about this definition. Very simple nowadays is a clear liquid is one which takes less than two hours to empty from the stomach. So this is the one which is taken as a scientific explanation. And of course, non-clear liquids normally are expected to take two to four hours, light meal four to six hours, and heavy meal is more than six hours uh, from the stomach. So we followed certain uh, scientific uh, collection methods. I will not go into the details. Just to mention that we had important collection of uh, various articles. Almost 600 articles were collected with uh, research questions for different specialities, as I told you. And the usual uh, research techniques were followed. And we followed what is the protocol. Great protocol is a protocol on how to prepare the guidelines. So this was also followed by our group. And one special thing we followed, when I started, I told you about the Indian fasting practices. So we did two things. One thing was we prepared a survey questionnaire for perioperative fasting and feeding and shared with our colleagues, not members, but hospitals and institutions across the country, North, South, East, West, and North, East, Central India also, to know about the institutional practice in terms of the NPO dietary habits. This was very important. So what type of uh, breakfast or light meal or heavy meal will be normally prevalent in those areas and that's how they are followed. And this was a validated questionnaire. Again, we validated it and published in IJA before the guidelines were formulated. <clears throat> and uh, we took up various guidelines one by one. So one more thing I would want to highlight is we enlisted the support of a dietitian. So she was an MSc, PhD dietitian. So the presence of that lady was very, very helpful. She gave us a list of evidences from nutrition journals from across the country and across the world. So for, I can give you, they, they had radio labeled studies on gastric emptying also, which we, we didn't know before. So that was one strong point in our study. For example, they will say somebody has to take one chapati, somebody has to take one needly, and they were able to give us the nutritional content of each of these food items. 
So let us go to one by each recommendation one by one and slightly expand and we can have a discussion at the end of presentation. So this was a recommendation related to the adults. So the first column is the one which is broadly the message conveyed by the group. The clear liquids should be hours prior to administration of sedation or anesthesia. When I say it's a strong evidence, means we should try to implement. There are strong research evidences that show that administration actually up to two hours of clear liquid, including water, is very much beneficial to the patient. So it's not just in terms of being the empty stomach, but overall, I told you about the problems related to prolonged fasting. So this will be overcome if you allow the clear liquids, including water. And the second one was another important thing which you proposed. So up to 450 ml, so how much of water you may think. So we can give up to 450 ml of water till two hours before the procedure. So there were studies which talked about 100 ml, 250 ml, 300 ml, 400 ml, 800 ml. So there are different studies, but we could arrive at a figure of less than 450 ml or up to 450 ml, which is ideally to be administered two hours before administration of anesthesia. Then uh, the rest of the recommendations are largely similar to the other recommendations. Non-clear liquids may be allowed up to four hours prior to administration. Okay, so they are pulp-containing ones. So they have got prolonged duration of elimination. Light meals up to six hours prior to administration of sedation or anesthesia. And this is about heavy meals. So this is another important thing we found with our dietitian expert also. Uh, in fact, our Indian heavy meal is actually takes longer time to be eliminated from the stomach. For example, ASA says about eight hours and more in terms of AV meals, but we found evidence to say that it's uh, in the stomach for more than 10 hours. Even in your practice, you would have seen uh, something like biryani. So patient uh, would have taken and uh, it may have been six hours, eight hours, 10 hours. Again, patient may vomit out a lot of this material. And therefore, heavy meal consumption is not advisable the night before surgery. This is very important, which we are practicing anyway, but we are able to get strong evidences. So we have the um, fear of aspiration. We also routinely try to administer anti-aspiration prophylaxis. So aim is to increase the pH and reduce the volume of the gastric contents or both. So normally we use uh, the histo receptor blockers, proton pump inhibitors. We talk about sodium citrate as non-particulate and Acid and uh, drugs like metoclopramide and then dexamethasone also. So do they really have any value? Is it useful in an elective case in an adult population? So look at this table. It is not useful. Okay? Routine use of aspiration prophylaxis in adequately fostered patients is not advised prior to administration of sedation and anesthesia in adult population. So this is uh, uh, actually explained by other uh, guidelines also. And we also found the same thing. So there is no need for a elective procedure. Patient who is well fostered, there is no need to administer aspiration prophylaxis. And only thing is, if you feel specifically that uh, as an individual anesthesiologist, there is a risk, you can decide. So that much of uh, margin is given. And this is also surprising. H2 receptor blockers, proton pump inhibitors, and prokinetic drugs, which are used normally by us, okay? What is uh, the real effect in terms of reducing the pH and contributing to better patient outcomes also we could not get. Okay? So high-risk patients, we talk about high-risk patients. Whether it is really beneficial in high-risk patients is also not clearly proven. But of course, uh, <clears throat> we are not talking uh, too much about this. But we will go to the next section where we can have some evidence. So this is about the recommendations for obstetric patients. So this is very common amongst us, 30% of our cases are mainly obstetrics in private practice. Women in early or late pregnancy when administered sedation or anesthesia may be considered to be at a high risk of aspiration. So definitely we can say there is a risk of aspiration in these patients even though recommendation is weak. So let us be on the safer side. There, are, there is a high risk in the pregnant patients. And the recommendations with respect to clear liquids, non-clear liquids, light wheels, is everything same. So in terms of duration, there is no difference between adult and obstetric population and the heavy meal. And with respect to the heavy meal consumption, but what we can say aspiration prophylaxis 
it's a normal in patients uh, who are coming who are obstetric patients coming for cesarean section or labor analgesia okay and of course there is not uh, much to choose between which is better amongst them whether it's two receptors or proton pump inhibitors or a combination with respect to aspiration prophylaxis in obstetric patients what about bariatric patients those are obese again obese patients all of us consider that there is a high risk of aspiration in general this is uh, uh, practically speaking i say okay let us carry forward that uh, background knowledge and again just like obstetric patients in terms of duration of fasting there is no difference it's not that you um, you you uh, you uh, yeah, fast the obese patients for a longer time that's not the case just like obstetric patients and with respect to aspiration prophylaxis it may be administered in obese patients prior to administration of sedation of anesthesia so one difference you can make out here is with respect to the normal adult population when i said pregnancy we must administer aspiration prophylaxis even though and there is a greater risk of regurgitation as aspiration but in bariatric patient there is a greater risk but evidences say there is definitely uh, not a strong evidence for administration of aspiration prophylaxis but it may be administered so that's the important part so just very easy for you to remember so here we are talking about aspiration prophylaxis must be given almost in the pregnant patients but in bariatric patients even though there is a greater risk we don't have a strong evidence for administration of aspiration prophylaxis then we go to the pediatric guidelines so we could get very nice guidelines and evidence not guidelines evidences related to water clear water strong evidences and i mean uh, recommendation also could be given consumption of water up to 3 ml per kg should be allowed until one hour prior to administration of anesthesia so this is a strong one which all of us can follow and consumption of clear liquids other than water up to 3 ml per kg can also be allowed up to 2 hours prior to administration there is a separation between water and clear liquids here please remember okay 3 ml per kg of water 1 hour before and clear liquids other than water up to 2 hours before this is the difference here but for water there is a very good evidence and we do recommend strongly we can give up to 3 ml per kg one hour prior to administration pediatric patients and of course human milk and fully skimmed non human milk can be allowed up to 4 hours prior to administration of anesthesia non clear liquids non human milk formula feeds light breakfast light meal may be allowed up to 6 hours prior to administration of anesthesia this is pediatric guidelines then with respect to the aspiration prophylaxis we don't have any evidence so don't get confused with the phrasing of this statement this is how we are expected to make Uh, what it says ultimately is uh, we can decide on an individual basis whether it is uh, recommended to administer anti aspiration prophylaxis in pediatric patients then i come to some important uh, part i feel this is special to our indian guidelines so i told you there is so much of disparity in terms of the food items we consume so you can see so many things here coffee tea porridge standard everywhere and mari biscuits and we have got uh, the banana the chapati roti and uh, idli vada everything is there and of course bread i told you about these guidelines so if you look at this table which they had talked about so they talk about lot of uh, things including uh, bread boiled in milk and fish okay these are western things and they have talked about beef tea so it is definitely alien to us we don't talk about beef tea right in fact then i went through the literature it says it's a simple decoction made by steeping beef usually rump meat in water for a couple of hours seasoned with salt and so many things so we have got <clears throat> so many things which are not which are not part of our normal intake so western guidelines talk about toast and clear liquids sandwiches soup salad loaf of ground lamb and beef so these are things with some of them i don't know a uh, pork cucumber and a pickled slaw radish carrot and onion this all i got from the asa guidelines so this we don't follow so that's the reason we thought about getting our own um, database related to the food items so we could arrive at this table now this is part of our publication you can also go to the ij website and we have uh, uh, isa website also i have arranged for uh, some of these ready recommendations to be displayed and download so these are the examples 
with the scientific evidence, clear liquids, that is juices without pulp, apart from water, which empty in less than two hours. Look here, coconut water up to 400 ml, black tea up to 200 ml, black coffee up to 200 ml. Then very strange things are, means what we know, use normally, sandalwood sherbet, brew of saw, tooth sherbet, aerated cool drinks, tetra pack juice, rice spongy, clear soup broths, and more different preparations. So all of them are eliminated within two hours. Then you've got non-clear liquids, again, rava porridge, ragi malt. So these are all different items, milk, buttermilk, milkshake, cold coffee. So these all come under non-clear liquids. That is, they are eliminated within four hours. So these are all, of course, these are these volumes which I mentioned is mainly for adults. But the items are the ones which are used in India in different parts of the country. And light meal, you can see, bread slice of one number. Okay, full cow with vegetable, one with four spoons of vegetable, curd 200 ml. The dal rice 150 grams, idli with sambar one number, oha, avalakki, so these are puffed rice 150 grams, mari biscuits four number with milk 150 ml. Uh, at least I didn't know these uh, details uh, till I started this project. Then glucose biscuit four numbers with milk 150 ml. So these are the ones which are considered as light meal. Then heavy meals, we have got all the details thali, noodles, pongal. The different thali rice, poriel, the, these are all the, some things which are specific to different parts of the country and including the use of burgers. So, all these things are clearly mentioned. They take more than six hours. <clears throat> so, I would say this is one of our strong points for Indian uh, practice among our group. Then, we attempted for the first time how fast, how early we should be initiating the post operative feeding. Adult, we could not get any recommendations per se. Uh, so we are not, uh, we could not reach some uh, statement here at all. Obstetric patients, clear liquids can be allowed orally eight hours after cesarean section and the regional general anesthesia. So this is a little bit controversial because uh, in different fora, including our own expert uh, in obstetric anesthesia who was part of our team, uh, they had some reservations because uh, all of you have seen that private practitioners nowadays, I mean obstetricians allow early intake of water, clear liquids. But uh, we are there to modify also. But at this point of time, we have only recommended the guide, the, the evidences and research to talk about only eight hours. The so-called earlier than eight hours, six hours, four hours, people will say, no, no, I administer, give water to them within four hours, within five hours and all. This is based upon what is known as the ERAS protocol. So ERAS protocol has got certain uh, research questions and evidences. But clearly, for a pregnant patient, normally, we don't have evidences. Maybe if there are evidences, we may have a update later on. Pediatric patients, we could get strong evidences that we must restore oral intake as early as possible. As I told you, first of all, they become irritable, they will be crying, they will have hypotension, they will have dehydration, they will have electrolyte disturbances and metabolic acidosis whatever care we take. So it's advisable to listen to oral diet as much as early as possible. Bariatric also, we didn't get any recommendation with respect to post-operative feeding. Then procedural sedation is the part two of our uh, guidelines, apart from anesthesia. We couldn't get much uh, evidence in terms of the strength. So what we have decided is you either follow the guidelines for the anesthesia per se, and if it is outside the operating room and other remote locations, probably we should be more strict. Uh, guidelines per se are not available because we don't have that much of evidences. <clears throat> we touched up on gastric ultrasound. Till our publication, uh, ASA guidelines also, there, nobody spoke about gastric ultrasound. After our publication, now everybody is picked up the same data because I told you gastric ultrasound is the future to talk about the gastric empty. So we did for the first time talk about gastric ultrasound, its utility, and but we are not given any recommendation because we are very conscious that whatever we declare uh, should not reflect and uh, produce a negative effect on our practitioners across the country. Even though gastric ultrasound, the gastric uh, ultrasound is not possible to be done routinely because ultrasound machine is costly. There is need to get training, and uh, I know the PNDT Act is also a problem in between. So we refrain from talking about the use of ultrasound. 
but we have to remember that in future gastric ultrasound may also find a recommendation in the routine guidelines so okay. last one or two slides uh, just want to mention how do our guidelines compare with other guidelines especially asa guidelines asa guidelines so i told you asa guidelines did not speak about the separate set of population we try to get from obstetric pediatric bariatric sections and ultrasound sections and separately and we tried <clears throat> for the first time about the post operative feeding and fasting duration uh, uh, with sound evidences also and of course we also followed all uh, the international protocol in fact uh, i can say it took us more than 2 years uh, to complete a project so that also represents i think uh, some of the efforts put in by, by our team so that people should not say we did do a quality work and the fried foods i told you about the heavy meals so we had more than 10 hours in our guideline because our food uh, food items are different from the western food items and some of them are likely to be there in the stomach for more than 10 hours okay and gastric ultrasound we had a second uh, separate section and the pediatric section the last asa guideline not the one published in january talked about two hours we could arrive at the figure of one hour for um, water in the pediatric patients and in terms of um, clear liquids also two hours and there is a i will not go into further detail this is a european society guidelines then uh, uh, there is an guidelines which are published in 2022 so there were some minor differences but largely they were similar but we were able to take up the indian evidences also per se and there is something about the chewing gum we didn't take it up much but we did go into the details of uh, tobacco chewing in india per se so some areas of the country the people to chew tobacco a lot so those were also noted by our group but the only thing is we apart from the difficult airway things there is no direct problem with respect to tobacco except there have been instances that people keep the tobacco and deposit them in their cheek so that is one risk that may happen in the perioperative period so thank you very much <clears throat> this is <clears throat> in brief uh, in summary because uh, the <clears throat> greater details i have not discussed because that's not required so thank you very much so we can have any questions taken up from our group today Thank, thank you. you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much for excellent presentation. I think uh, till date uh, this was the most uh, uh, applicable uh, uh, presentation. We are to do investigation guidelines. For each and every animal. Yes. Yeah. The cardiac anesthesiologist or a pediatric anesthesiologist or a obstetric uh, anesthesia practicing person. So this is uh, useful for each and every anesthesiologist. And the most important point which I liked is that. Uh, you have also taken in consideration regarding the re uh, resumption of uh, oral intake so mm -hmm. previously we never thought of uh, or usually we tell uh, every patient that uh, you should not have food for at least next 6 uh, to 8 hours but uh, these guidelines will definitely help to practice as better and one more point which i liked is that we can allow clear water for uh, in pediatric patient 3 ml per kg uh, before one hour uh, before taking to operation so, so these are the important points now i request uh, all the participants to uh, unmute their self and they can ask any question if they have hello may i ask a question sir yes yeah. madam jyoti madam please yeah I wanted to ask the when we give obstetric uh, analgesia, labor analgesia. I mean to say, so once the analgesia is properly established, and the patient has four five hours to deliver, uh, do you allow liquids in between these four five hours? Yeah. So one of the updates uh, which we fail to recognize. So normally our mind straight away goes to talking about solid foods, madam. now that we have uh, clear uh, guideline support what are liquid liquids so if you go back to our list of uh, clear liquids basically so i think definitely we can advise uh, people to go back and try to um, pick up these 
uh, not just clear water. So we have talked about the tender coconut water. We have talked about uh, look here. We have talked about black tea. We have talked about watermelon juice, sandalwood sherbet. So something like that is ideally to be given. So even in pregnant patients, because we know uh, when they come from different places and they are fasting for a long time also, and there is a prolonged labor, uh, there could be a risk of dehydration. So I think we can concentrate on giving clear liquids to the patient beyond water also as per this list. So this will be my suggestion. And this is an important uh, outcomes of this current guidelines. Yes. Of course, okay. we'll avoid, avoid giving solids, definitely. Thank you, sir. Sir, there is one uh, question from Dr. Amit Hivarkar. Yeah. Uh, he wants to know whether uh, alcoholics where uh, the subset of alcoholics were included in this study or the guidelines. Yeah. So we did consider many, many things. So you, this, this included, I told you, no, tobacco achieving different parts of the country, pan parak achieving uh, with betel nut and without betel nut, then alcoholics also achieving gums. So everything was considered. So alcoholics, uh, basically the problem was with respect to the evidences and whether it can be clearly given. So one thing is, one problem with alcoholics is definitely the volume in terms of the fasting duration and whether they have taken any solid foods also. So this was being considered. And secondly, with respect to um, the pharmacology related to the other drugs which we use. So we assume that somebody who is a chronic alcoholic has got uh, some disturbance in pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of the drugs in the liver. So whether a drug like it is especially typically cemented in, they got a very much prolonged duration of action in alcoholics. So the risk is always a possibility. And per se, the Guidelines did not touch on alcoholics, mainly because we did not have strong evidences to talk. So when we talk about guidelines, we must always be picking up the evidences. Without evidences, I should not be talking. And another reason is, when we talk about guidelines in Indian condition, I told you in the beginning itself, we have kept the private practitioners in mind, so that when, unfortunately, if you are dragged to a court, court of law, so some acts of... Uh, Commission are, are a problem. So minimum things which must be followed are always mentioned. And if you want to say that there is a patient who is alcoholic and who has come, definitely we don't have evidences for or against alcohol, except that if it is an acute alcoholic and there is a loss of airway reflexes, there is a greater risk of regurgitation and aspiration. But in terms of the duration, of course, if the, if the alcoholic is purely alcoholic, it empties very fast. And if you have taken snacks and if you have taken uh, mutton then uh, something like that, so it lasts in the stomach for a longer time. So definitely there is a greater risk, but we are not able to arrive at a scientific declaration. We are also wondering why Western groups have not given. Western groups have only discussed, mm -hmm. but they are not given. So that's the reason we didn't take it up. And similarly for chewing gum. So chewing gum is just finding a mention in the January issue of uh, the update of ASA guidelines 2023. So chewing gum per se, generally, physiologically is good. Okay, just like drinking water up to one hour before. So when we take water or coconut water, it is said, it will increase the, the motility of the stomach and it will promote gastric emptying and stomach gets emptied very fast as opposed to fasting. The disadvantage of giving the li clear liquids or water even up to one or two hours before the procedure. So similarly for chewing gum, one concept is let the patient keep on chewing and the, the saliva goes into the stomach and it promotes gastric emptying. So that way, but if somebody has got a, a chewing gum deposited in the cheek, so that could be a risk during airway manipulation. Yes. These are the things which are discussed overall. Yes, yeah. so, thank you. Thank so, you. So, uh, yes, Balai sir, please. Sir, uh, I have want to ask you two questions. One is, sir, uh, what guidelines say about uh, particularly diabetic autonomic uh, uh, neuropathy patients or those patients in which you suspect gastric emptying time is to be getting delayed? One. And you mentioned about strong recommendation and weak recommendations. 
there is no doubt that we should accept strong recommendation but there are some weak recommendations what should be our approach for those weak recommendations yeah <clears throat> so because uh, just few days ago i presented this in another forum our colleagues were telling you see you remove the second column second mm -hmm. column was where i had uh, put that recommendation level they mm -hmm. say you are confusing the practitioners confusing the pgs so why did you give a direct answer they say you give this and you don't give this so i could i had to explain to them i can very easily say no you give this and don't give this but i just wanted everybody to understand that the, the guidelines are still guidelines only guidelines are never mandatory except that it gives you a broad idea of uh, evidences collection so it's not uh, these are clinical guidelines formulated as per the international protocol by experts uh, for example the great protocol says somebody presents a guideline within 6 months it indicates that they have done it poorly so in terms of time frames in terms of uh, how somebody has to prepare guidelines there is a scientific advice and this book itself is about 200 pages so why i am trying to convey is something is strong so all of us are academicians also yes we are practitioners but still let us have some background so when there are strong recommendation means for or against something so for example i told you aspiration prophylaxis is not required in adult patients electively it's a strong recommendation means there are no evidences to say that administering anti aspiration prophylaxis pre operatively is beneficial in normal elective adult population so that way uh, we decided I, I, i just decided to share those type of slides also just to give us an idea and whenever there is some problem related to a particular patient we are expected to give our opinion take up uh, for example i am uh, sitting in in the nursing home and i am called for an emergency cesarean section or whatever emergency of course we are not covering the emergency per se but imagine all of you know there is a primitive setup sometimes our services are requested for so when i go there for example i don't have assistance in terms of uh, the ward boys i may have a limited supply of oxygen so these things are there so in such situations i wanted our colleagues to know what is the strength of his recommendations also and the available strength of evidences so that way uh, when you talk about a, a diabetic autonomic neuropathy uh, somebody who has got 10 and 15 years of diabetes so definitely there is a greater risk so when such a risk is always there Uh, we should be playing safe so i would definitely say i would uh, give anti aspiration prophylaxis to the patient practically even though it's a weak recommendation so that's the reason when we open up the article if you have got time please open up the article we have picked up all these points there are lot of medical comorbidities there could be lot of surgical comorbidities and surgery itself definitely if there is a intestinal obstruction and anastomosis i will not be telling that you restore the patient to oral intake at 6 hours or 8 hours because it has to heal then there should be ileus should go there should be restoration of bowel sounds and so many things are there so these aspects have to be taken care of by the individual anesthesiologist thank you sir thank you sir uh, there is one more question from dr manjusha khandagale madam uh, she wants to know uh, guidelines regarding the use of uh, sometimes we give oral dye for uh, before doing gastroscopy and colonoscopies so are there any specific guidelines for uh, using uh, these oral preparations before uh, the procedure no it's a good question they have been touched upon in terms of uh, the iodine containing preparations uh, in fact um, but we are not able to get the evidences for the guidelines per se but discussion has already been there definitely but the simple the level of the amount of evidence that is available says it is safe in terms of uh, okay there is no risk of any regurgitation or possible cases of aspiration are not there the considerations are purely related to the other things anaphylaxis and other things yeah thank you thank you sir i think uh, you have elaborated this topic uh, very clearly and there are uh, strong and weak re recommendations but definitely we need to go through the uh this isa guidelines in detail to find out our own uh guidelines at our institutional level because there will be as you said that if suppose patient is having some uh, intestinal obstruction obviously these the guidelines are not valid for those patients so you have to decide on the case basis as well as depending on the setup in which you are practicing 
So that's what uh, I think uh, we should take from this. Yes, sir. One point, one point I would like to highlight is very small things. Uh, you know, I, I know you all of you know uh, our surgeons uh, generally are um, colleagues are also skeptical. So they don't want uh, us to be more aggressive here. They will say, no, let us play safe. I don't trust me. Nursing staff and that and all. So they still want to have overnight fasting. Okay, overnight fasting is acceptable. But when the patient is fasted for longer than required, so what we can always do is um, till two hours before, at least safest, even in pediatric or adult, at least if there is a rough idea of uh, the timing of the surgery, we can have people take water. So that's one thing uh, that I see definitely will be beneficial. Number one. Number two, uh, just to share with you, this maltodextrin preparation is a good one. We may get it in the next one or two years in India, next one year itself. <clears throat> uh, I told you about uh, the, how uh, taking a liquid and a clear liquid or water helps. So it goes into the stomach and promotes gastric peristalsis and promotes empty. This is one thing. So we can take clear liquids. Number two is, uh, they have talked about uh, energy drinks, including protein-containing drinks, which are uh, and uh, the maltodextrin drinks, which are published in January 2023 now, which I mentioned. They, they have compared previously dextrose. All of us, we say, no, I gave glucose water, I gave coconut water, I gave api. So, for example, glucose has been compared, fructose has been compared with uh, sucrose and many things. They have found that definitely there is a, some increase in blood sugar levels, number one. And they promoted gastric empty. But the fourth one, maltodextrin preparation, they found is the best one. Because it causes minimal increase in blood sugar levels and can be safely used in diabetics also, number one. Number two, it empties a gastric uh, uh, contents faster than the other types of sugars. And this drink is already available in Western countries and it's also part of ERAS protocol. And uh, I think one or two companies uh, I discussed even yeah. one month ago were interested. So what we can have is, for example, we are used to administering or uh, dexamethasone uh, normally to the patients. Uh, we can always uh, suggest, uh, for example, it's available as a liquid or as a sachet. So we can say maltodextrin drink plus ondansetron, for example, can be given as a standard preoperative advice. So that is the way, one of the ways I think we can convince our surgeons and they will also be happy. Instead of telling you keep on giving water, coconut water, they will not be happy. And if you get something from the pharmacy, I think it will be more likely to be implemented. Yes, very, very true, sir. This is a practical point and you have very nicely elaborated this point. Uh, I think uh, I thank Balabaskar, sir, and all the participants for uh, attending this uh, presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you for uh, sparing time early in the morning for uh, this presentation. We are very thankful to you and I, and I hope that we will uh, see you soon in Aurangabad for uh, another physical activity. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.